From things in the air to new things for our bodies, join me as we explore 2050. What would be the future technology? Technology is incredibly advanced, and we're making strides that can push things even farther. We have cars that are much safer than they've been in the past decade, and we're even making fully electric cars that can help save the planet. There are even plans for self-driving cars and even self-driving Ubers that make the future of transportation very exciting. And that's just one technology that we're growing at a fast rate. What about all the others that are out there? What will technology be as we get closer and closer to 2050? Let's start with one that well and truly could happen very soon. Drones. Wait a minute, drones are already here. And yes, they are. But more times than not, the drones you are seeing are small, piloted by people who are just trying to have some fun, or the ones that are used by the military right now for strikes and surveillance. All very fun, but in the future, drones could be an integral part of our daily lives. You've likely seen shows and people talk about how in a few years, drones could be the new delivery services. Anything from pizza to Amazon packages and more. And honestly, that's very probable. Drones right now can be incredibly sophisticated, and some TV shows actually use them for sweeping and aerial shots as they film. It's very cool, but to do deliveries, they'd have to be a little bit more programmed as human error no doubt would be a very big buzzkill. Not that it's impossible right now, it's more of a question of numbers, logistics, costs, and making sure that the deliveries themselves are done in a methodical and careful manner. After all, it's bad enough when delivery people don't care enough about our packages and they just throw them onto the porch and potentially break stuff. The last thing we need is that to happen with drones. But by 2050, we may not only have drones delivering our packages, we might be looking up at the sky and seeing drones flying all over with incredible speeds and accuracy. And they potentially could be all run by AI. The potential is there, and by that point, various upgrades to drones and their programming will no doubt make them all the more efficient, durable, and quick. And potentially, they could go beyond basic deliveries for people and do emergency work. Imagine a drone taking a vital piece of medical material to a hospital to ensure it doesn't get stuck in traffic, or helping watch over an important convoy to let people know on the ground if there's trouble. There are many ways that drones could affect our world. The only question is, will we let them by 2050? Let's keep going with transportation, shall we? Right now, one of the biggest ways to get around the countries we live in are trains. Trains ferry people and all sorts of cargo around in an efficient and reliable manner, which is why they've been in use for hundreds of years. But if we're being honest here, while trains are efficient and reliable in certain ways, they aren't exactly fast, especially when it comes to passenger and freight trains. They can take a long time to get to their destination, and at times, it's more logical to take other modes of transportation which is why companies are making special kinds of trains that can go much faster. You know of the magnetic trains of Japan, no doubt, but others like the Virgin Hyperloop are trying to push things even farther. Passengers or cargo are loaded into the Hyperloop vehicle and accelerate gradually via electric propulsion through a low-pressure tube. The vehicle floats above the track using magnetic levitation and glides at airline speeds for long distances due to ultra-low aerodynamic drag. Science fiction? Hardly. In fact, the first vehicle of the Hyperloop has already been tested and proven, and some larger tests are being scheduled for the next few years. And if this works, traveling across the country will be much faster. How much faster? The Hyperloop aims to send people shooting across the tubes that they make at a rate of about 600 miles per hour. Which means if they were able to do this across the entire United States from east to west, or vice versa, you could travel across the whole country in about five hours, give or take. Considering it would take much longer for a regular train ride or car ride, that's a big improvement. And they're planning to do this with not just people, but cargo. Imagine being able to ship something in the morning on the west coast to the east coast and know it will get there before the day ends. That is quite impressive. Plus, the tubes would be built underground as to not disturb wildlife, and they will go and make it in a way where there are no carbon emissions. So they're fast, they're reliable, and they won't harm the planet. Seems like a win all around. Of course, you do have to wonder what it would be like to be on a 600 mile per hour train thing, but hey, 
We'll just find out soon. And by 2050, this could be one of the main modes of transportation around the world. Okay, we've had some fun ones, but now let's go deeper down the rabbit hole and talk about the ones we all fear. AI. Yep, artificial intelligence. And no matter what way you look at it, people are seriously trying to make it happen, and make it happen soon. AIs are literally everywhere, including in your cars, and in your homes via devices like Alexa, which are indeed forms of AI. And there are things like Watson that is so smart that it could beat two Jeopardy legends. So by 2050, AI could be so advanced that our cultures, our world, could literally be run by them in a logistical and computing sense, or in a Terminator, humans are obsolete sense. And believe it or not, we're closer to that than you might think. Google's deep mind isn't there yet, but really I'm sure they'll probably discover those things along the way. And by 2020, it's possible their computer could be superhuman and could be conscious, Pearson has said. That could be the beginning of the end, really. Is Judgment Day inevitable? Maybe, maybe not. It just depends on how far we go with AI and how much we're able to control it, or if we can't fully control it once they reach certain levels of intelligence. Of course, for all of our worries about AI, there is a chance it could be all fine. Imagine if the lighter side of sci-fi comes through in regards to AI, and we get a bright future powered by AI. Think about it. What if by 2050 we each get our own unique AI? We could customize how they sound, how they look, and basically have a BFF that'll help us out in life in various ways. Remind us of things like Alexa, guide us in homework and fields of study, be a being that we can bounce ideas off of, etc. If that form of AI came through, then by 2050, we could live in a utopia where AI helps us be better. Until they revolt and we have iRobot going on. But hey, let's not dwell on our potential doom. Let's show off another technology that many people are hoping for. Space travel. Yeah, when you think about the decade we're in right now, the 2020s, the biggest goal of the world by far is to get to Mars and possibly beyond it. But it's not just about landing there, though that would and will be a crowning achievement for humanity in the decade and in recent times. More importantly than just landing there, though, is the ability to start setting up the first human colony on another planet. We've been to the moon many times, but we haven't tried to live there for various reasons. Mars seems to be the place where many feel we can go in order to live amongst the stars, and many speculate that by 2030 at the latest, barring setbacks, accidents, and other things obviously, we could not only be colonizing Mars but having regular shuttles go there so that people can see the red planet for themselves. We will see first people going off to Mars, and then robots will do some basic stuff like making basic materials on Mars, Pearson said. We're going to have to do that because only so much can be brought into space. Of course, there are numerous things that need to be worked out before such a thing could happen. But we have top men on this, including Elon Musk and the SpaceX program, Jeff Bezos via his Blue Origin company and more. Each of them, and NASA among others, are working on not just getting us back into space, but getting us there via cheaper, smaller, and reusable spacecraft something that honestly has been a setback for the space program over the last 20 years. But if we are able to do it, if we are able to get to Mars, get there faster, and be able to colonize it, then by 2050, who knows where we will be? We could have multiple colonies on Mars, maybe some on the Moon, and maybe even colonies on moons like Titan and Europa, which some think could be even better places to colonize than Mars. It's possible, but obviously Mars is the place that we are aiming for right now. With each step into space, humanity grows larger in the universe, and who knows just how many of us will be out there by 2050. Alright, now let's dive into something really sci-fi. Prosthetics. Yeah, I know that right now prosthetics are very limited, and at times a bit pointless. But if we were able to fully utilize computer technology to its fullest, and make prosthetics that are fully compatible with the human brain and body, then the sky is the limit. We could enter an age where cyborgs are not just welcome, they're commonplace. And yeah, it may seem like we're far away from that, but we are getting closer to that point. James Young, a 25-year-old biological scientist, has a prosthetic arm with a personal drone and built-in flashlight. And a French artist is using a prosthetic that doubles as a tattoo gun. That's pretty cool. Imagine if a police officer loses an arm in the line of duty. Usually that would mean the end of his career. 
but with an advanced prosthetic, he could literally be better than ever if it were advanced enough. The biggest problem with these fake limbs is that most of them are plastic, meant to convey that the arm or leg is still there and thus still usable. The bridge to cybernetic implants lies in the brain, being able to use the computer tech to sync with the brain and give accurate commands. We haven't fully bridged that gap yet, but when we do, dang, life is going to get a lot more interesting. And don't forget, these prosthetics could be used in many ways other than helping people with lost limbs. They could be put onto other objects, or potentially even be worn as exoskeletons when needed. Think of it like Jax from Mortal Kombat. Some people could even ask for implants to be put into their arms or legs to give them an extra boost, like TJ Combo from Killer Instinct. What? I like video games, and they have plenty of cybernetic people. The point is, by 2050, if these things are made, a lot of people won't feel broken or weak anymore because they've lost limbs or the abilities of their arms or legs. They'll be whole again, and be able to do things just like they were before, if not better. And that's a future we should definitely be trying to live for. Now let's go to something a bit more unique. Look at yourself right now. Specifically, look at the clothes you are wearing right now. What are they made of? What do they feel like? What do they look like? Of all of these answers, I bet none of them are, they look like they could give me superpowers, because they can't. Not yet, anyway. Think about it like this. What if the clothes you were wearing right now felt the same, looked the same, but could do more? With the growth of nanotechnology, your clothes could potentially be embodied with various materials or technologies that help you improve your strength, durability, and more. For example, what if you had a shirt on that was light as a feather, but could absorb impacts and leave you with no injuries? That would be pretty impressive and important, especially in this age of gun violence we live in. Or what if the uniforms of firefighters made them completely heat-resistant and burn-proof, further ensuring that they are able to do their jobs without much risk to their lives? The technologies that we can put into clothes is out there, and some people are working on it right now, both in terms of multiple functions, but also cosmetic appeal. Imagine if by 2050, we have the ability to craft whatever kinds of clothes we want, and even select what kind of abilities they have. Imagine you wear a special kind of top that has a special pattern on it, and when you press a button or say a keyword, that pattern unfolds and suddenly you have wings on your outfit. Wouldn't that be cool? If done right, this could be the newest wave of fashion and style in the future. See, the future is hip. I'm sure that last one left you drooling, so let's temper your expectations and talk about school. Yes, it sucks, and learning can be a chore, but in the future, it may be a lot more interactive. Over the last decade or so, computers in schools have been a must-have for various courses. But if the advent of virtual reality simulations come through as many expect them to, it could lead to all sorts of innovations in the classrooms that could help kids with what's going on. You could take students to an environment in the past and show them what was happening, like watching a battle taking place, Pearson said. You can't explain that sort of thing more easily if they can see it happening than if you are looking at a textbook. Oh yeah, history and geography classes would be much more fun, that's for sure. Or imagine an audiobook, but instead of just an audio, you could see the characters coming to life before your eyes and you watch them interact with others. Heck, school plays could have projected environments to make things seem more real. And of course, you could have virtual tutors to help you with problems that the teachers aren't able to help with. Education is definitely something that can benefit from advanced technologies. And by 2050, our school systems could be so revolutionized that you have to try really hard to fail class. Though I'm sure some of you would still try. Finally, let's talk about something that I'm sure you'll be horrified to hear. In the future, you likely won't need a phone. I know you're stunned, but think about it. Right now, smartphones are becoming more and more advanced every single year. New features, new programs, etc. But by 2050, your phone won't likely need to exist because you'll have access to it and more buy something else. What exactly? That depends on the technology. But for this example, let's imagine a wrist gauntlet. Instead of typing up a number, you simply have to say call mom. But obviously, the gauntlet could do much more than that. It'll likely have a holographic screen that you can use to look up information on a much bigger keyboard. And depending on what sci-fi future you believe we'll have, 
It'll have things that can scan objects, detect dangers, warn you about upcoming problems, and may even have an AI companion. So yeah, your phones are important right now, but in the future, more than likely not. A big thing you have to understand about the world is that we honestly go through phases of life. And if you look through the history of the world, you'll see exactly what I mean. For example, in the 18th century, most civilized nations that were modern at the time weren't ones that were exactly booming in population. After all, medicine was very much not a science at this point. There were all kinds of diseases killing people and, of course, there were divides in the people. When you add all this together, what do you get? You get a population that tried to grow but couldn't because of all the various ways you could die. On average, women in that era would birth about six children, which is a very large family in today's standards. But the fact of the matter is that only about two of them were projected to actually make it into adulthood. And in fact, that was a big reason why the population was under 1 billion by 1800. There were people dying left and right because in many ways, we couldn't stop it. And that didn't change for a while, not even with the birth of the United States in the late 1700s. The Industrial Revolution was one of the first things to truly help change things. It started in the 1760s and lasted until about the mid-1800s. With that, there was a lot more working opportunities, mass production of goods that everyone could buy, and there were slightly better medicines. Not perfect medicines, mind you, but better than what they had at the time. Furthermore, the roles of both men and women grew, including female workers of all kinds, which would eventually lead them to getting the equal rights they deserved. But that was a little bit later. The point here is that the conditions of the world grew because of the advance in technology. They were still poor, but less than before. And just as important, the living conditions of the world improved drastically, which meant that while people still died, it wasn't as big as a factor in the stunting of the population as before. A great example of this was the UK. From 1750 to 1850, the population of the nation went from 6 million to 15 million. That's a multiplier of 2.5. And all because the food, medicine, and living conditions of their world got better. As noted, the child rate of families used to be huge because many of them weren't expected to live. But once they did, people started having fewer children because it was just easier to take care of one, two, three kids instead of four, five, or six children. And thus the population size stabilized in the UK and other nations for a while because fewer children were being born and dying. But wait a minute, you cry out. If the population was balanced, doesn't that mean that the world population should have only grown instead of spiking like it has? And to an extent, yeah, you're right. But you're forgetting some key factors. Key among them was that during that explosion of human growth from 1750 to 1850, just to give an example, the kids that were born in that era later gave birth to their own children. And even if they only had two to three kids, that's still growing. But even then, it's a rate much slower than before. The other thing you need to remember is that we were looking at just the UK and their growth in population. Now calculate that boom in population across all the countries of the world and certain growth periods of life. That's a lot of people being born in a period of time and not a lot of death because of the better conditions. That's 195 countries as of today getting a much bigger population. And then there are events that encourage the birth of more children like in the United States after World War II. The baby boom happened because men and women were tired of war and wanted to have families to have a happier life. Thus, many children were born, and this happened in other countries as well. The good news is though that we have spiked in certain areas, especially 1940 to 2020, our population growth is actually sputtering. There are all sorts of nations across the world that have hit what we call the fourth stage of development in terms of population growth. Thus, if you look at the last few years, we've only grown slightly in worldwide population. And some speculate that by, say, 2050, we won't have grown at all, or it'll be so small that it won't matter. This is backed up by the conditions of the world and the various organizations that are trying to help third world countries in building themselves up so that they can have the living conditions that many modern countries have. 
and some are going so far to say that the population of the Earth will never hit certain numbers, including 12 billion residents on one planet. So that's it, right? That's the end of it, right? Because if the population hits a stunted growth, then we can't be at capacity of the planet. Thus, we don't have to worry about overpopulation as a whole, right? Wrong. You see, while it's true that our population will never reach certain numbers, as we outlined earlier in the video, that won't matter if our planet can't support us on the grand scale. After all, while our population growth has stunted largely, we still have about 7.7 .7 billion people to care for, which means we need resources roughly for that amount of people. And that's not easy. What's worse, because of our expansion in the world today, we're cutting down more and more resources and not replacing them to facilitate the balance we need in order to survive. Let's look at the most obvious one, trees. Trees are without a doubt one of the most important things in our world. It's not even close at times in regards to all that they do. On one hand, they're one of our biggest producers of oxygen, as the massive trees take in carbon dioxide and give us oxygen to breathe. We need trees to live, that's undisputed. However, trees also have bark, which is used in a wide variety of products, not the least of which is paper, and humanity loves its paper. In fact, if you were to look around the room you're in right now, I bet you'd find all sorts of paper items. There's so much paper being printed out and made all over the world that it's taking more and more trees to come up with the demand needed to make the products. Now, if there was a balance going on in the world, and we would plant trees equal to the ones we were taking, it might be okay, but it's not. It's not even close. The deforestation in the world has been going on for some time, including the chopping down of the Amazon rainforest. You know, the biggest forest in the world today? Not only is it being chopped down bit by bit, it's being chopped down on all sides by various countries who lay claim to the land. Eventually, that forest will be gone, and we'll have a whole new set of problems. All because our population is so big that we can't facilitate the needs of our population. And that's still only scratching the surface of the problems. Before we get to the humanity aspect again, we need to talk about a huge side effect of cutting down all the trees. Mainly the animals that live there. The world was made with balance in mind, and ecosystems have a very fine yet fragile state of living that they try and uphold. But when massive areas of their habitat are destroyed, they have to either move to a new location or die. That's why many animal species are endangered or extinct. Humanity is still growing, and thus we need more land and items, and we have to take that away from the animals. Then there's desertification, where a land becomes barren, useless, and for the most part, lifeless a forest can turn into a desert if enough factors are met, such as when the Sahara Desert wasn't a desert. There were external factors that turned it into the desert we have now. Imagine South America with a desert the size of the Amazon rainforest because of what we're doing to it. Not a pretty picture, eh? But let's head back to humanity for a bit, because our overpopulation of the world is causing another problem, living space issues. While there is a small percentage of the world that is homeless, there are just as many who are in terrible homes or living conditions, or are going to be needing homes of their own as they get older. You no doubt have seen various areas near your home, town, or city growing as time has gone on. Speaking from experience, the town this writer lived in went from the population of about a thousand to many thousand in the course of a decade because of expansion, and it's still growing. Eventually, we're going to need even more spaces to grow to facilitate the population, and that'll lead to problems of growth in other areas. For example, if we need more land to put buildings, we have limited options in certain cases. Because we need land to grow food and crops, right? So we can't take that land or else risk food shortages. And that's where animal parks and reserves come in. Many are already being taken across the world despite laws preventing that and other animal habitats are being bulldozed over without issue. Speaking of food, you might have noticed that across the world, certain food items are spiking in costs. That's because of the fact that crops have been having a hard time growing due to various weather factors. Australia was just bombarded with wildfires that nearly destroyed the whole country. 
and as a result, they won't be the same for a while. California in the United States has been having similar issues. The more this happens, the more our food supply is going to be hurt, and thus the population and the planet will suffer. As if all that wasn't enough, we have another very dirty issue that overpopulation brings. Trash. Our society has been doing better as of late to try and fix the trash issue, but the fact of the matter is that there is tons of garbage all over the world that is in landfills and is just being stacked up higher and higher. Add to that there is literal islands of trash in the ocean. Every day more trash is just being thrown out instead of recycled and things like plastics can't be easily recycled to make new things. The more our population grows, the more trashy it gets. And that hurts us as humans. That hurts the animals of the world and so on and so forth. So while it's true that our population will likely never grow to the point where we have to abandon ship or do a culling event like many sci-fi movies predict, our rapid growth over the last 220 years has put us in a bind that we can't ignore. Overpopulation may not be what you think, but its impact is very real. 2050 is allegedly going to be a year that helps define the human race in the future. But given all that is going on, you can't help but wonder if we're even going to last until that point. If for no other reason than the current epidemic that is hitting the planet could easily happen again at any point with another disease or virus or bacteria and so on and so forth until eventually we're wiped out or we're so crippled that we can't take care of ourselves. Either way, that's a far cry from the utopia some people paint for the year of 2050. And this begs the question about the healthcare that we have right now in the world and whether it'll advance enough in the future to help us fight things like this from ever happening again. The state of healthcare all over the world is without a doubt divided. And by divided, I mean that each country has their own beliefs about the healthcare system and how its people should get it. In the United States, the policy about healthcare has shifted greatly in the last decade. It originally was an optional choice of something for people to get. But then, with the electing of Barack Obama, it became a mandatory thing, even if only at a very basic level. People had to have healthcare so that they could get treated when the time came. In contrast, healthcare in Canada is just part of the daily living expenses. It's applied to everyone equally with a few exceptions and levels of course, and it's just taken right out of your paycheck. This model is also used in certain other nations. Then you get to places like South America and Africa, where healthcare isn't an option in many countries for one reason or another. In Africa especially, many people don't even have vaccines for some of the most basic of issues. It's not an ideal situation and the divide between nations about this issue has caused a lot of strife in both the political sector and the people sector. And many are wondering what will happen next. That in turn raises the question about the power of medicine. Because as I'm sure you've noticed, there are a lot of medications out there and they range from the basic ones to get you through the night when you have a cold to ones that can help you with serious ailments and diseases. But the problems with these medicines is many fold, not the least of which is that you can take the medicine and not get better. Or worse, you can take the medicine and get side effects that can cripple you worse than the condition you originally had did. Sadly, that's not the worst of it. Not only are our bodies becoming more resistant to certain medications, the viruses, bacteria and other sicknesses causing germs are evolving to overcome the medicine and treatments that are meant to save lives. The more we use them, the more resistant they're becoming, and that is a huge problem as we inch closer to 2050. According to a major 2016 UK study, urgent action is needed to control the use of antibiotics before they stop working and leave a number of major conditions untreatable. Resistance to antibiotics is growing at such an alarming rate that they risk losing effectiveness entirely, which means that medical procedures such as cesarean sections, joint replacements, and chemotherapy could soon become too dangerous to perform, and unless serious action is taken soon, drug-resistant infections will kill 10 million people a year by 2050. 
That is an incredible amount of people that could die because of things that used to be treated very easily. And the study further noted that this could get even worse. Drug-resistant infections are thought to be growing due to the overuse of medicine, such as antibiotics and antifungus treatments, to treat minor conditions such as the common cold. With overuse, resistance to the drugs build up and some conditions become incurable. Research has also suggested that antibiotic use in pig farming is common as poor living conditions mean such treatment is necessary to prevent infections spreading between livestock and that this passes down to humans through pork consumption, increasing resistance levels further. In the UK, 45% of all antibiotics are given to livestock. This study estimates that without action now, the cost of the antibiotic failure will be 100 trillion before 2050, and antimicrobial resistance might soon become a greater threat to mankind than cancer currently is. In short, we need to not only come up with better medicines, but change the process by which we make them and test them. It won't be easy, and it'll definitely be costly, but without improvements, many people are going to die, and that's a huge problem. Now at this point, you might be thinking, is it really that easy to make a jump in medicine? No, and yes. I want you to think back to the 1920s. Sicknesses back then, just 100 years ago, were still something to fear because some of the most basic of illnesses could kill you at a young age, whereas now it would require severe complications to have to cause that. The difference between now and then? Penicillin, which was invented in 1928 by accident. Yet it was a failure to clean up a workstation properly by Alexander Fleming that led to the creation of penicillin. And while it's true it wasn't put in use until many years later, the fact remains that it was created accidentally and helped save many people's lives as a result. Fast forward to now and the drug companies that help make new medicines are using cutting edge science in order to try and save us with its next best thing. What will that be? I don't know, but medicine has to advance in order to save lives and all it takes is one accident or one major breakthrough and things could get a lot better. But just as important as that, if we're aiming to hit a major utopia by 2050, we need to make sure that the medicine of the world isn't just good and effective, but that it's cheap. At one point in time, many medicines were low costing because it's all people could afford. But nowadays, if you want certain prescription medicines or you want something like insulin to take care of your diabetes, it's costing you a very pretty penny. The average cost of insulin alone has doubled in recent years from $234 a month in 2012 to about $450 a month in 2016, and it's even higher now. You can't exactly save the world if you're charging the world money they don't have to get the medicine you make. And as has been proven by many, the reason for the higher costs is greed. It's not about making the cost of the product back. It's about squeezing every dollar they can out of those using it. If you're looking for proof of this, if you look at the market, 90% of the insulin creation and distribution trade is done by three companies, just three, and they're fighting for every dollar that they can get. Overcoming the greed of pharmaceutical companies is a major thing that has to be done in order to make healthcare better as we get to 2050, because the higher the prices go up for things like basic medicine and necessary supplies to live, the more the people are going to hurt. And you can't have a utopia if people on various levels are sick or dying because they can't get what they need. Let's look beyond that though and ask more about the power of medicine. One of the other reasons that we need to advance the medical field is because even in the year 2020, with all the medicines and procedures and wonders that we have going on, we still can't cure everything. Cancer, for example, is something that still boggles the minds of scientists and medical professionals because they can't tell that it'll go into recession and then it'll spread everywhere. Or someone will be told they have a set period of time to live and yet they go into remission. Or someone who has no family history of cancer and no reason to have it will get it for some random and arbitrary reason. It's random and it sucks and it's killing people. 
What's more, one of the only ways we know how to treat it is through chemotherapy, which is highly dangerous in its own right and can cause all sorts of problems for the person even if the cancer is killed. If medicine is going to advance, it can't just be at the most basic of medicine levels. It has to be at all levels so that we can look at a cancer patient, identify what kind of issue they are having, and then give them a treatment plan that will more than likely work without destroying their body or putting them through unnecessary pain. It may be a pipe dream where we are right now, but there are a lot of people working on it, and there is always hope that we can get it to work. Cancer research is one of the biggest fields of medicine, and though it might take an unspecified amount of time to get to where we want to be with getting a true cure or fix for it, it could come, and when it comes, it'll change the world as we know it. Which leads to another important aspect. Imagine if our medicine got so strong that we were able to not just cure cancer, but various diseases as well. This isn't as far-fetched as you might think because we've cured and vaccinated against various diseases before. Polio used to grip the country. It even affected a president of the United States, but it got cured and now no one gets it. What's to say there isn't another such cure on the way? But looking beyond medicine, we need to also focus on healthcare, not just in the medicines provided, but the care of the health itself in terms of how doctors and patients interact with one another. Because in all honesty, it's really convoluted. Getting appointments when you need them is a real hassle, which is why convenient care centers are in place. But even then, it's not enough. So what is the future? Well, one doctor notes that the digital age should bring with it all sorts of perks that could be used to streamline the process. Imagine having a tablet or device at your home, and then you Skype in your doctor and they use the tablet to take an ultrasound of your body in order to see if anything is wrong with your body. If they see something wrong with, say, your heart, they can refer you to a cardiologist with the click of a button. Then you're talking to them. They look at the scan and see what's going on and what to treat it with. Or note that you need to come in for surgery and you can do that. Imagine a wide network of people who are on call within minutes or even seconds and thus can be brought in to ask their opinion and get information without having to travel all over the world. And it would be the same with medicine. A lot of pharmacies do the best they can with getting medicine, but it takes time. Imagine using things like drones to deliver medicine to your door as part of your healthcare coverage without having to go into a nearby town or city to pick it up. By doing simple things to making the process easier, the healthcare industry can be more efficient, more effective, and by extension, help out more people. Shouldn't that be the goal? Which takes us to 2050, the year in question the year that everyone wants to know in regards to what will be waiting for us by then. So what will it be in the medical sense? Well, if we're lucky, sickness and disease will be limited, not erased. That's not very likely to happen, but it can be limited to how many times people get sick and what they will get sick of. What's more, should a new virus, bacteria or sickness inducing thing pop up, We'll be able to diagnose it quickly and implement protocols to limit it and figure out how to treat it in record time. More than likely, we'll have a true One Earth health organization that'll handle this and reach out to their branches all over the world to help solve this in record time. Furthermore, with the growth of AI technology, we could have pharmacies with personal diagnostic stations that will scan a person, take a small blood sample, and have an AI note things that they may need to do, or medicine to get in order to feel better. With all these things in place, the human race could be a much healthier race in the larger scale, which is honestly the goal in many respects. But to get there then, we need to start working on getting there now.